So now that we've seen what the first isomorphism theorem can do, let's take a turn and figure out if we can prove it. Is it always true? Does it always work this way? Can it be this cool? Fortunately, the answer is yes. Remember, the first isomorphism theorem is cool because it does two things for us. All you have to do is supply an isomorphism from G to H. And this theorem gives us a normal subgroup of G in the form of the kernel of that homomorphism. And for free, it also tells you exactly what the factor group of G mod that kernel looks like. It's isomorphic to the image of that homomorphism. Let's figure out if we can prove the first isomorphism theorem in its fullness. So again, starting from this diagram, I've got a homomorphism from G to H. Let's let K denote the kernel of phi. It's a normal subgroup of G. And then let's describe this association of GK to phi of G. We're going to call that function gamma. So this is the supposed isomorphism between the factor group G mod K and the image of the homomorphism phi. So why is it uh, actually an isomorphism? Well, so we're going to think of the factor group G mod K as kind of living here in the middle, right? It's going to take every coset of K and think of it as a single element, right? That's how the uh, quotient group works. And the first thing I want to do is try to convince myself of why gamma is even a function at all. Why is it even a well-defined function on the set of cosets G mod K? So to figure that out, we just have to show why any two elements of the same coset are going to have the same image uh, under this uh, function gamma. So let's take x1 and x2 and suppose that their cosets are the same. x1k is equal to x2k. Now because of how left cosets work, the equivalence relation which defines left cosets, we know that x1 inverse x2 is going to be an element of k if x1k and x2k are the same coset. But here k is an element of the kernel. And so therefore, if x2 is equal to x1 times k, then what's going to happen when I apply my function gamma to these two cosets? Gamma of x2k is going to be equal by definition of gamma to phi of x2. But on the other hand, phi of x2 is going to equal phi of x1 times k by our construction. But because phi is a homomorphism, that's equal to phi of x1 times phi of k. But remember where k lives. k lives in the kernel of phi. And therefore, phi of k is the identity element of the group H. And so this is equal to phi of x1. And running our definition backwards, phi of x1 is exactly gamma applied to the coset x1k. So if x1k and x2k are the same coset, then gamma sends them to the same spot. So at least gamma is a well-defined function on the factor group g mod k. Now, why is gamma a homomorphism? If I take gamma of xk and gamma of yk, and I multiply them together, what am I going to get? Well, by the definition of gamma, gamma of xk is 5x. So it's sending the coset xk to the element 5x inside of h. Gamma of yk is sending the coset yk to the element 5y inside of, k, of h. But on the other hand, because phi is a homomorphism by presumption, this product is equal to phi of the product, xy. But by our definition of gamma, this is equal to gamma applied to the product coset, xyk. So gamma is sending xyk, that coset, to the same place that the product of 5x and 5y are going to. But on the other hand, because k is a normal subgroup, we know every kernel of a homomorphism is a normal subgroup. xyk is the same thing as xk times yk. And therefore, gamma of the product of these cosets is the same as the product of gamma applied to those cosets. So gamma is a homomorphism. Now, why is gamma 1 to 1? Remember, the key to why gamma is supposed to be 1 to 1 is that we've squished away all of the differences between elements of G that can be accounted for from the kernel of this, linear, of this uh, homomorphism. And so why do we get a one-to-one -one, uh, homomorphism here in the middle? Well, to prove that it's one-to-one, -one, we just have to show that if gamma sends two cosets, x1k and x2k, to the same place, then they must have been the same coset to begin with. So we'll apply our definition of gamma. Gamma of x1k is equal to gamma of x2k 
implies that phi of x1, that's the left-hand side, is equal to phi of x2, that's the right-hand side. But that implies that if I multiply by phi of x1 inverse on the left sides of both of these expressions, that means that phi of x1 inverse x2, I used the homomorphism property there a couple of times, right, both at the inverse and the product level, will be equal to the identity element of h. But that means that x1 inverse x2 belongs to the kernel of phi, because phi is sending it to the identity. And if x1 inverse x2 belongs to the kernel of phi, k, that means that x1k and x2k are the same coset, again, using the equivalence relation that defines left cosets. And so what we've just proven is that if gamma sends x1k and x2k to the same spot, that must mean that x1k and x2k were the same elements of g mod k. So gamma is a one-to-one -one function. It's a homomorphism, and it's also onto, and it's onto purely by our construction, because the target space here of this homomorphism is nothing more than the image of phi. And by definition, everything in the image of phi is getting hit. And therefore, this gamma is a well-defined function on the quotient g mod k. It satisfies the homomorphism property. It's one-to-one, -one, and it's onto, and therefore, this gamma is the hidden isomorphism inside of the homomorphism from g to h. And that furnishes a proof of the first isomorphism theorem. We'll close this series of videos by looking at a couple more examples of how the first isomorphism theorem can be your best friend in answering what are otherwise some tricky to answer questions in group theory, namely about normal subgroups and also about properties of groups that you might not know, but you might know something about the homomorphisms that come out of them.